prepared. <laughs> okay, so I, I am recording it, um, and right. we can just. Uh... Do I need to do my preamble again? <laughs> <laughs> I'm struggling with some issues about how columns implement grid cells and how the mini column hypothesis work ties into that and how grid cells work at all. So uh, I just wanted to run some thoughts and ideas by you guys. And I want you to challenge me or tell me what I'm thinking about wrong here. First of all, I'll start off. Did you see my screen? Because we don't know how, how yes. good cells. Okay. Yes, we see it. Okay. So the more I get into this, we just, it just seems to me we really have no idea how good cells create a metric space. Um, we proposed in our papers this little image here that said, hey, we had a bunch of grid cell modules. They would work together. And that was really cool. It had all these wonderful properties. But it seems like that's evidence for that is just lacking. Um, this requires too many modules, uh, requires a whole bunch of them, and they all have to be sort of collect, you know, near each other. Uh, and it also requires them to be the same scale. And as far as I can tell, the evidence, it, there's no evidence for this. Um, you know, we're not seeing this, at least in the antirhino cortex, we're not seeing this kind of like, oh yeah, I got dozens of these grid cell modules that are, I can pull from and, and pick cells from each and, and figure out my space. And all those grid cell modules are slightly different. So, um, you can challenge me if you disagree with this. This, I, this is why I'm, I'm bringing this up. I want to see if anyone disagrees with this. On. Well, I mean, I know what you mean. Uh, uh, I, for example, we posted this video online, and then people who in the community heard the quote you just said, I'd have to qualify it with all sorts of things, like the idea that six or seven modules isn't enough. Like, uh, I don't object because I know what you mean, uh, but I know other people would object. Okay, well, I'm not going to worry about what two other people think. I mean, yeah. we need a we need a, a distributed representation, and um, I'm not aware of any evidence that in like the antirhino cortex, there is even multiple grid cell, even two grid cell modules per scale. Uh, there might be seven total, something like that, uh, but they vary greatly in scale. And in our world, that wouldn't work. Um, and um, and uh, it just it just doesn't. It, I just don't. I don't know. So I, I don't believe this and, anymore. And and those are on uh, on mice and rats, right? Yes. So potentially we, those could be uh, it could be larger in primates and humans. It could be, but it's got to work in rats. Rats get around the world pretty well, right? Um, so um, I just I, I I you know there's a whole bunch of pieces of evidence here, and Marcus may remember some of them, but like you don't see a lot of uh, pre projections going across the scales at, on the grid cell modules. Um, and, and you, you know, it, it, and the spaces are large. We, we'll go look at the tank image again in a moment. If you go, well, I'll just show it you right now. Go back down to the tank image. You know, this is one grid cell module, right? Uh, the one in the outline pink. And that's pretty big. That's like the size, uh, you know, it's like 360 or two by 250 microns. And when I talked to Tank, he said this was at a different scale. This one, I believe he said it's at a different scale. And so it's not like if I wanted to have 10 of these guys and pack them in there, we would be talking something that's, you know, it's really large for the mouse and the cortex, I think it would be large. It would be certainly larger than a millimeter square, um, which is big. And um, so, I don't know, I just, I no longer, this is a great story, but I no longer believe it. Does anyone here actually think I should not abandon it yet? <laughs> I also think it's probably the wrong story. I don't know for sure, but uh, well, I, nobody knows anything for sure. So yes, I agree. Okay. When you say the wrong story, um, what do you mean by that? Is it, I mean, the idea that multiple modules together give you a more disambiguated location signal? Uh, I guess all of our work requires everything. All my thinking right now requires that you have a very large potential metric space and that individual objects have their own spaces and they're fairly high resolution. Um, so you need a, a large amount, you, you need to have a lot of modules and they, and they certainly almost all, otherwise, you, otherwise you're, you don't have uniqueness in your space. So what I, I guess I'm saying, what I don't believe anymore is that this is how the brain creates a proper metric space where it's not, you know, in, in, I think we'd all agree that an individual grid cell module is insufficient to re representing the space of something. It's just the cells repeat every once in a while, and it's just not enough representation. You're just limited to if there's 20 cells in your, you know, in your phase quadrant or 
or you know something like that. The twenty different positions you can represent. That's it. You only get twenty. You know, you, you need something with high numbers. You need something that says, "Yes, I can large, represent large spaces in many of them um, uniquely." So that's what I mean. That this that this system. So you're saying the metric space is not the unambiguous part is not large enough. Well, the, the way but you we still think you're still saying that multiple modules give you no, I'm not I'm disambiguation, that, or you're thinking each one is by itself. I'm, I'm saying the system we propose, which requires multiple modules, I no longer believe that is how it's being done. The, the way we're showing it here in this paper, I no longer believe that's the way it's being done. Hmm. Okay. Um, is that surprising to you that I'm saying that? Well, I sort of, it's a question of degree, I guess. If you have two modules, come, it seems like together they would give you a less ambiguous space. They would, a less ambiguous. But it's but not, not big enough. But not highly ambiguous. Right. Right. I mean, for, it, just think about it this way. Yeah, I guess, you know, you could argue that, um, you know, one of these green dots or one of these red dots, is that one cell or is that a bunch of cells? If it's one cell, then you're relying on the coincidence of two cells, which is like, that's not good for a brain. Even if I had, even if I had 10 modules, I'd be relying on the coincidence of 10 cells and some, and some other cell someplace else has to detect those 10 cells to get a good SDR and that's still on the list. So now you could argue that each of these green dots and red dots is a, is a bunch of cells. Um, and I'm gonna get that in, in a moment. Um, I'm gonna get to it in a moment. But, but that's not the way we've been thinking about it. Um, that's the way I've been thinking about it. So, so. sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead, Robert. Um, so this is something that I haven't been clear with yet after reading this paper. Is the, um, I understand how you like, I, mean, I understand how you like get a unique location code by like finding overlap in grid cell representations, but in these modules, are they like in a, in a column? Are they in like a larger area? I'll show you in the next picture. Okay. So uh, the next image. So I, I think we've described this is how we, we, our theories require that an individual column has, has a large uh, ability to represent a large number of large spaces. And, uh, and the way we achieve that is by assuming there are a lot of good cell-like modules within a column. Okay, if it's and, within a column, sorry. Yeah, this is all would be within a column. Because in our, in our theory, in the thousand brains theory, each column is, is able to represent um, uh, it's a complete sensory motor system and is able to represent complete objects. So um, that requires, and that requires it to be able to have uh, a, a reasonably large metric space um, for each object it's understanding. Well, if there are a few modules, then uh, you could get, with less precision, you could get this to work with, by having larger grid fields, roughly, uh, right? Uh, wouldn't Probably wouldn't be as precise. Well, I guess it's a combination of precision and, and, um, right, and yeah, size, okay. right? That just the number of unique locations you can represent is small. Yeah. All right, and that's that's the problem. It's not like I can represent a space. I need precision. You know, when I make a prediction about my coffee cup and my finger, it is fairly precise to where I am on the coffee cup. It's not super precise, but it's it's not like generally, you know, I'm within some half of the cup. No, I'm and I got to be able to do this uniquely for many many objects, not just one object, many objects. So. We assumed in our papers, I don't remember the actual numbers we assumed, but we, we assumed that we had quite a few of these modules to pick from, and that's how we got to be large spaces. Um, so I, I just, so uh, just, I don't believe this is the story, right? I don't think the story is right anymore. So I would think that um, you could get around this problem to some extent by the, the fact that um, there's topology generally in, um, for example, visual cortex, sensory cortex, motor cortex, et cetera. And the, the cell intrinsically knows, or the column already knows basically which part of the world it, its uh, input is coming from. But if, so that, that there is, means the, sorry. I think, I don't, I'm not sure if you understand the theory well enough. Maybe you do. Probably not, I, but I think I'm so an individual, you know, it. I believe I'm very confident in this. An individual column in visual cortex, uh, if it's, it's like looking at the, on its own could recognize objects. And um, it doesn't need to know where it is relative to other columns. It's like if you were looking at the world through this narrow straw yeah. and, and only that's the only thing you could see, you can still develop models of objects. You just have to move the straw around. And, um, and you can do that. And that's what individual columns are doing. They, they collaborate later, they can vote, right? They can vote to reach a consensus very quickly, but on their own, they're capable of learning 
This is the whole thousand brains theory. They're capable of learning complete uh, sensory motor objects or uh, use sensory motor learning to complete learn complete uh, dimensional objects. So you have to think about a column on its own being able to do everything. And uh, it's limited to how much it can do, but um, it can do everything. So where it is in the, where it represents on the retina is not that important. Um, it's just a column and it could be a sensory motor, it could be a tactile column, it could be a column someplace else in the brain, it doesn't matter. The column. Right, and I was thinking that it could be partially true in the sense that like there, there I mean, there are, the lateral connections are immense, right, in all cortical areas. And you assume that you can sort of loosen that, uh, the criterion for how many, um, how many of these like grid, uh, grid cells, grid cell modules it will have uh, by, Gaining information. No, but the, but but the theory says that adjacent columns have to have their own metrics. I understand. I understand. So I understand. then you I'm can't then like, you can't rely yeah. on other you can't rely on other grid cell modules in the neighboring column because they have to be representing different things. Oh, not grid cell modules, but uh, just connections that give some context to like okay, this is like your part of the world, like enriching right. that information somehow that would help. I, I, I okay, I, I don't want to spend too much time on this. That's fine. I don't want to go down that path. Maybe that's right. Maybe it's wrong. But that's not the path I want to go down right now. At the moment, I'm assuming a single column. I want to go with this assumption. I think it's right. A single column can recognize complete objects. I'm not going to rely on the neighboring guy. I have to understand how a column does this. And, um, and therefore, it has, to, it has enough cells to do this. We just don't understand the representation scheme very well. And by the way, I don't think this works in the entorhinal cortex either. This is the method. These are, this all came out of the entorhinal cortex, and you know, the rat knows where it is. I don't think this problem is solved for It's not solved for that. I don't think people understand how it is. That you can go from a grid cell module, which is a very poor representation of space. Um, it's got metric properties, but it's very poor. Um, it's not suitable. But, and somehow you go from that to having a very rich and suitable representation of space. Um, and I don't think you can do it with a lot of grid cell modules. And so and a rat, even though it's a rat, has a pretty good sense of where it is in the world. And, um, and, and, and let's go on. So to me right now, unless I don't see a way to re at the moment, sting with a single column. I don't see the way th this system works. Marcus, you're perhaps with me on that. Um, and uh, so I'm going to go on. Um, I want to, this, this again is the tank image. Um, and um, and, and it, it suggested a number of things that, were that we didn't know before. At least I didn't know before until I saw the tank image. Some of these things were known before this paper, but I didn't know. Um, this is what this is his image of a grid cell module in Tirana cortex, and so this this and, and this is one grid cell module, and the blue is another one, and the yellow is another one. And, and as I said, these are changing in scale. In the, and I, I it's, it's not clear to me whether there are other grid cell modules in the rat and Tirana cortex that are at the same scale as this one. I, I don't know that. I asked Tank that he didn't know. I've asked other people; they don't seem to know. So all we know is that that this thing of this size. Um, is one grid cell module. And it's reasonably large. You think about a rat brain, a rat's entorhinal cortex, it's not that big. Um, and we know it has a bunch of these at different scales, uh, laid out linearly, roughly. Um, so it's, 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 it's not like, oh, there's gonna be a hundred of these lying around. I, that's not possible. <laughs> Could there be two or three, four, maybe. But even four is not enough for me, in my, in my thinking, at least I don't think so. Um, so what was what was unusual about this was, was things a couple of things that jumped right out of it. That it he, this is the first time that I had seen an image which showed where the actual grid cells are relative to the grid cell module. And that was the purpose of this paper in some sense. And, and so he showed that there's actually, in this particular grid cell module, there's four sort of mini grid cell modules, which he called phase quadrants. So each of these six, I mean, there's six of them, excuse me. There's six of these phase quadrants, and they're all basically doing the same thing. They're all essentially representing uh, a location. Uh, this color coding here is this famous little, you know, tip, what do we call this? Lion shape thing. <laughs> Rhombus. Rhombus, thank you, Marcus. Um, uh, and so each one of these is showing, hey, all these different cells within here, you've got the cells that represent each of these different phase positions. And of course, they repeat over and over and over again. So. Uh, the red cell would appear one place and then it would be active in another place if you're physically moving through the world. And so you have six of these guys. What's good? That's sort of redundancy. That's good. You, you know, you wouldn't want. And, and, and then there's another really, really interesting thing that came out of this paper, which was that he showed that in a reliable sense, sometimes one of these or a couple of these cells would not become active when you'd expect them to. 
and it was reliable, meaning in the context of a specific location in an environment, let's say this cell here would just would not become active when you'd expect it to, and the other ones would. In a different location, another two cells would become, wouldn't be active. So there was like an additional sort of coding scheme that went on top of this, and it wasn't noise, it was very statistically, uh, it was just very precise to where the animal was, there was another sort of encoding scheme that were laid on top of this. So you could, you could say by reading out which of the red cells were active, that not only are you in the red area in the world, but there's an additional coding, like these four cells are active and these two cells were inactive. So that gives you a way of scaling or multiplying the number of things you can represent here. So in, in the, and I wrote that up here. I said, Hank and others have shown their multiple phase quadrants in the module. Uh, and any individual cell in the quadrant may not be active. And this is a, a encoding larger space. So in this case, you could have up to six choose N um, different encodings uh, of, um, well, you know, assuming there's some, like there's four or there's three active at a time, something like that. So if I said, oh, what if there's three of these cells active, three not active, then it'd be six choose three. But that's still pretty small. Um, and then if you relied on that mechanism, then you even have fewer cells that are active. Then it might only have like three cells that are active that represent the location of this animal. And it's just not enough to do anything. You know, you can't rely on that. Um, so this was, I, I kind of walked away saying these are, this is a really big clue that this, this cell module is not just a bunch of six cells for redundancy. There's some other coding scheme going on there. There's something else. There's something else that doesn't explain that. Um, why those sometimes those cells are active. And so I wrote it down, it seems to be an important clue. Um, and so I've been trying to figure out what that means. So this is not, this is not a proposal how metric spaces are encoded. This is, just a, this is just an observation about how a good cell module actually looks in the antimonal cortex. And, um, and it's a clue. Do you know what the, uh, so I don't know about this experiment, but in general, like, do you know what the uh, recall timeline is for that? So is this all like when they put the mouse in, you know, environment one and then environment two, but if they wait a day or so and they recall, do you, do you get these uh, I don't remember, it might be in the paper. Um, yeah, I should look at that. But it, I, you know, it was, uh, my recollection was that it, it was it was very specific. It was like if the animal recognizes the environment, this is what happened again. It's, it was part of the encoding scheme. You know, just like uh, if the animal, go, put, you put, put the animal back in the same environment the next day and recognizes that environment, uh, the same cells would be active at the same locations in the, in the environment. Um, okay, so but you'd still get the silent grid cell thing. I think so. I could read it again, but that was my recollection. I don't know if Marcus or Super Okay, so then it's not a working memory thing because you might need that redundancy. To no, it didn't look like a working memory thing. It looked, it looked like an encoding scheme of some sort. So okay. They, they, they just made an observation. They said, hey, look, this, these cells don't always fire. And, here's, and they had a bunch of data about it. I could read it again. They had a, a, a lot of data on that. So, but I think they were trying to show that it's reliable, it's consistent, and it's location dependent. That's my recollection. But I haven't read the paper in, in I don't know, six months. Yeah, and there's, a, there's, there, was this, there were two papers that had results like this. This one was with mice using calcium imaging running on a 1D track. That's where all this comes from. Uh, there, then uh, there was another one from Kate Jeffrey, Dory Durdickman, uh, did, did it with rats running freely in 2D environments. And they, the paper is even called uh, Grid Cells Encode Local Position Information. Yeah, that's right. Because, because like, the, the cells firing rate would be different yeah. in different firing I think, fields in I a think consistent maybe, way. Maybe you pointed out to me, Marcus, but I think those other papers were earlier. Yeah. So that was already known. I only observed it here. For the, I only read about it here for the first time. But that was, you're right. There was papers just on this topic. <laughs> <laughs> so it's kind of stuck in my head like, yeah, that's a reliable result, you know. <laughs> yes, multiple researchers saw it. Okay, so now I'm stuck like, here's some of the interesting data. Um, and the method we propose to have this work, I don't believe anymore. Um, and then I, the first question is, and maybe, the, maybe Marcus, you'd be close to this. Are there any other proposed mechanisms by how large spaces are represented with the grid cell module? Or there are other people saying, oh, this is how I do it. You know, this is how you get away, the, get away from the grittiness. You know, because good cells, everyone agrees, are not very good. On an individual cell that repeats, it's not very useful. So are there other proposals out there? Nothing comes to mind other than things we've like drawn on the board. Uh, I mean, I'm sure people have tried to incorporate phase coding into it, having you know, the cells, the time they fire in the cycle also encodes something. Uh, 
but oh, I can't just oh, give you a good. Yeah. Oh, that, that's a good, I, I didn't know that. That makes a lot of sense. Well, I'm just making this up, but I'm sure people have done it. Uh, okay, that's an interesting avenue. I hadn't been thinking about that. Um, and channel uh, Florian on this? Uh, well, it's not, I'm not sure it's a Florian issue. It, 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 well, I mean, well the, the gamma and... Uh, yeah, I know, but we were talking, I think Marcus was talking about, we, we, we discussed some of the stuff before Florian got here, but yeah, anyway. But yes, Florian talked about some of this stuff a lot. Um, uh, that's an I, I, okay. I, maybe I could look for that. Um, um, but uh, I mean, we talked about how we talked about how the whole um, theta uh, procession, the whole procession thing, could be done by the theta oscillation, you know, oscillatory model. But um, I don't remember reading something that says this is how you actually encode, you know, take a single grid sum model and this is how it codes where you are. That could work. Um, but it, it seems in the end, if you're going to encode a location, you have to have a bunch of cells that are firing at the same time. <laughs> and uh, that somehow uniquely represents that space, that location in space. So even if you're doing phase, some sort of phase coding thing, you'd have to, uh, you, you still need, it would be hard, imagine take this module here from Tank, uh, you'd still need a bunch of cells firing at the same time to represent the location. So I still have a limited number of cells to work with. So I'm not sure if that really helps me in this case, if I assume there's a good cell module like this. Um, so, um, all right, well, that's I, I will th I'll throw in one other thing. Like right now we, we're, uh, um, we have this need for this huge number of unique location codes because we're kind of running with the vision of you have a unique location representation for every location of like every location and every coffee cup or whatever. Uh, but there's, uh, there are of course other ways to do this where you might actually reuse the grid cells and have another populations representing, representing object identity or something like that. Yeah. Well, we it's really that, the combination of those two. We had that in our first paper, right? The, yeah. The, uh, what was it called? The title of that paper. Um, uh, theory of how columns in the neocortex yeah, yeah, yeah. learn like the structure that. of the world. So that's how we did it, right? We had we didn't know about grid cells. We didn't know about this idea of unique encodings, or the idea behind it. So we assumed that this the location space was going to be reused for everything, and therefore we had to rely on the um, the object cell layer um, to do that. And so we said, oh look, we have this object cell layer, layer, layer let's say three, and we have um, you know, and and that, and then we had a lot of issues with that one. I forget what all the issues were. One is we there's no evidence for layer three projecting back to layer four. It was like, no, the cells don't do that. And there was another issue too, I can't recall what it was. Um, anyway, we started there and we moved away from it. Maybe we could go back to it. That's an interesting idea. And it could um, be somewhere in the middle, like locations are somewhat unique and you have this other population that is somewhat of an object ID. Yeah. There, there's kind of a smooth spectrum here. As as uh, okay, I don't know if I agree if there's a smooth spectrum. Either you have a cellular mechanism using the object ID or you don't. And yes, I suppose you could. Uh, uh, anyway, I, I, if, 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 if you're not going to have a very good metric space, then you're absolutely going to have to rely on some other thing, right? You're going to have to rely on some other object ID or pose ID or something. I mean, even uh, in that paper, we did rely on a, on a you know, large enough metric space to be able to you know, place all the features we wanted onto that metric space. Yes, uh, that's right. So we did. even though it's not large <laughs> enough to encode all the objects multiplied by locations, you still did, needed it to be large enough to encode yeah, forget, precisely I forget, the. You're right. You know, I forget how many we used, but it wasn't it wasn't six or twenty or fifty. It was. Yeah, yeah. It was more than that. Anyway, so I'm I'm trying to come up with schemes where you could have you know, sort of some of the general properties we like, which are just like large spaces that are easily differentiable. Um, I mean, we, we achieve that in our temporal memory. The temporal memory allows you to represent a gazillion things because we use this multiple cells per mini column. And, and so you have a simple representation, which is the mini column representation. And then you have this really, really large representation, which is the individual cells in the mini column. So, uh, okay, so- Are these uh, locations Per column, are they relative? Or to they what? Absolute? Uh, relative to the relative to each other. Uh, the, the, the theory we've been working on is that these metric spaces have no um, no zero point. There's no um, uh, what's the right word for it. There's no origin, and so it's just this big mass of space that you can 
that, that, that's what this method achieved. When we, the method we described mm -hmm. in the frameworks paper and the other, some of the other papers, this, this basically says the space represented by a bunch of uh, Bitzel modules is super, super large, but there's no origin, there's no center, there's no, there's no, you know, it's just, you start anywhere and you can go anywhere. Uh, but, you know, the beauty of this is that you can do path integration from any point. You have this almost infinitely large space, you pick a point and path integration works. And, and so everything, everything nearby would be all in, together and, and they'd all be separated from each other in this huge space. Um, so that, that represented some interesting challenges, but it's, it's definitely different than you think about it in terms of you know, engineering uh, spaces where you have an origin. There is no origin. And the whole displacement cell concept um, was based on that idea too. There's no origin to which to do these things. Um, okay, so this is good. Let me just repeat what we said here. I'm gonna write this down. Um, we said there might be something to fade um, uh, with, um, what should I call it? Um, how we do this here. Um, you know, like phase phase encoding or something. Phase encoding. And um, also we had our um, object ID, that kind of thing. Idea. We had that in our earlier paper. Okay, uh, and I'm gonna run and I'm gonna run by a, uh, an idea. Um, and you can try to understand it hopefully and critical be critical of it. Um, so one thing, the next thing I'd say is, so, okay, I'm really, I'm really befuddled by the grid cell thing. I just don't see how this works. And there's some mysteries about it. The tank paper's got mysteries. And just see something seems wrong here. So I kind of went back and said, how would I redesign the system if I didn't think about the anatomical, those anatomical constraints, but I thought about other anatomical constraints. <laughs> so I went back to our mini column idea. And I said, okay, uh, and this, by the way, has got problems. So I'm not going to advocate this, but I'm going to run this by you anyway to get your input on it. I said to myself, uh, so in this, this sentence here, could a mini, you know, imagine a mini column, and, and I made the argument a, a week or so ago that in the mini column hypothesis, every mini column has every cell type. So therefore, there has to be at least one type of grid cell in a mini column. Um, there has to be a grid cell in a mini column because every, they don't exist. Every cell exists in a mini column. So that was the idea. And, and of course, if I, you know, there's about 120 uh, excitatory cells in a mini column. And, um, you know, it's unlikely I would just have one grid cell and one displacement cell, and, you know, one motor cell, but because there's just, there's more cells in there. I don't have 120 cell types in the mini column. I might have a dozen. And so that might imply that maybe I have about 10 cells of each type or roughly hand waving type of thing. So I said, well, what if a mini column had 10 grid cells? And they kind of act similar to our temporal memory. That is, um, under unknown context, uh, they all became active briefly, but then you'd pick an active. I said, well, that, um, that would give me a very, very large encoding space now, um, especially if I imagine that every minicom had one active grid cell all the time. And so in some sense, if I had 10 cells in the minicom, and that would be like 10 grid cells in a 1D grid cell module um, uh, that is in that direction of that minicom uh, vector. And so if I moved perfectly in the direction of the mini column vector, I would go cycle through these cells one at a time in some sort of order. I, I'm making this up, bear in mind. Um, and it would be like, it would be a 1D grid cell module. And if I had 400 mini columns in my column, I'd have 400 1D grid, grid cell modules. And that hit each one having 10, 10, um, you know, um, 10 steps before it repeats. And that's a huge space. That's monstrous space. I could represent everything I ever needed to. Um, that would work really well. Uh, the problem with that is that then I would expect to see if that were the case, and I and I go back to this picture, and I imagine that um, each of these col you know, remember a mini column in a rat is like 20 microns, and so this is would be one sixth of this. So each of these cells would be in like a different mini column, perhaps, or at least every ones that aren't identical to each other, and right on top of each other, and and therefore. You know, instead of looking at one cell here, if this was like the equivalent, of, if this was like the equivalent of a mini column in the cortex, I would have ten cells here, not one. I'd have ten, and then the question I had was, well, what if that was really happening? Um, what would happen to tech imaging method? They're they're doing some sort of imaging technique, and um, and they're looking down on the surface of the cortex and they're trying to see which cells are active. Well, if I had actually ten cells at each of those locations, they would be within about twenty microns of each other laterally. 
and they pretty much would be right on top of one another. So then I said to myself, how do we know that, that when Tank shows this image, how does he know that this is one cell? Maybe there's just 10 cells here, and he's picking out any one of those, and what's the depth of his imaging technique? If it's if it's more than if it's less it's more than twenty microns, he would pick up every cell in that in that mini column up that depth. You know, if they're assuming there's a mini column there. And he he was using calcium imaging, right? Yeah, uh, I think so, but I'm not saying. How, and what's the what's the depth resolution of calcium imaging? It's pretty fine, I think. Um, less than twenty uh, microns. RSU might know this better, but I think it's 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 a pretty uh, sharp, a pretty fine plane. That, how how uh, you mean how, how much fine. how much uh, signal are you getting from <clears throat> a plane? Planes that you're not trying to image. Yeah. What What is the depth of the plane? You're Let, let's say yeah. Let's say you're focusing in at uh, you know 50 microns deep or 100 microns yeah. deep. What's the plus or minus? Um, you know what's the range of microns that you can detect? It's pretty. You're small. asking what the depth of the field is. Well, From what's the, the, what's the limit of the technology? Point. Yeah. Well, yeah. So the the two pho the good thing about two photons is that it very it really minimizes this sort of uh, z like depth. Contact. How much? It will be like less than three microns. Less than three microns means you wouldn't find most cells. Most cells it's, are it's pretty much cells. one cell at each location, I think, at most. I mean, my impression, he's, he sets this thing. He's scanning over this whole thing here, right? I, he's not do he's, is, I don't think he's changing the depth in and out to find a cell. I think he's-, he's No, no, set, it's a fixed depth, but there's a fixed plane that you image from. Yeah, but- and at each point it, in the plane, you only get one cell. So, but I don't think- uh, he could make it as small as three microns because you wouldn't find those cells. No, they're, they're very densely packed. And the fact that they're about 10 microns in diameter yeah. each, means you yeah. get different cross sections. Uh, so so you're, saying, you're have, saying even if I'm smaller than the cell, I will see that cell. Even if I'm, if I'm sectioning just a third of the cell, I'd see it. Oh, sorry. Maybe, we're, uh, maybe I didn't communicate this clearly. Imagine this is your imaging plane. And there's like cells coming up, right? All the yeah. way the cell body so there's a cell body over here sorry this is bad there's a cell body over here yeah and then there's a cell body over here and you see it at a different cross section in depth the noise in the in the depth dimension is very small but you will see the cell because the cell is three-dimensional you will see a cross section of it and that's sufficient yeah yeah it, it works very fine I, I think what's happening here is that they're probably only reporting cells that were active and cells that they, they usually you have to discard some cells because of uh, if they're too close to your imaging frame, uh, to, to the borders of your image frame, there's like motion artifacts and you yeah. usually have to discard them. Well, this is something we should be able to look in the paper. Maybe I'll go look at it tomorrow. Uh, because I was, ima I'm imagining if I was the researcher doing this and I could set the depth of this thing, I want to set the depth that I make sure that I get a good representation of cells in all these phase quadrants. I don't want to so, be like, you know, I don't want to miss a cell because it's 10 microns too high or another one's a little bit lower. It's so not like because there's depth, there's more than uh, what you're seeing is all the cells that are within. I, I understand. Microns. I understand. But right. let's say I had, let's say I had the absolute minimal depth of plane. Then, and if the cell body is 10 microns, then I'd only be able to detect cells that are, you know, you know, nine microns above or nine microns below type of thing. And my point, my point is yeah. in the actual experiment, they were not, trying to isolate individual cells as much as make sure that they were able to see cells in all these phase quadrants at once. Now, it, 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 this is a tissue here, and this is going over a fair amount of distances here. So if I'm going across 360 microns, what is the chance that I'm gonna set this thing to even five microns of depth? Because the, chance, the chances of me having a properly intersecting all these cells at some layer is, is pretty nil because the actual tissue is moving around and so on. So I'm curious. I I'd be I wouldn't be surprised. I want to go look it up. It should be in this paper. Um, what the depth he set it to, because he's trying to try to get a depth where he can see a whole bunch of. He wants to see cells active everywhere. He doesn't want to like have it have the curve of the tissue fold off a little bit and then nothing is visible over here. You mean you you're not getting like a full like three D stack? You would want to see the whole depth of the. I don't want the whole depth. He wants to have enough depth to see a cell. Oh yeah, yeah. But I'm saying he wants to see enough cell. He wants to see cells active everywhere here. Yeah. If he sets it to three microns, he's not going to get that. He's going to get. You can't set it. This is uh, This has to do with the points. This has to do with the optics. Um, I'm sorry, I can't. Isn't the depth? Isn't this? Uh, you can find the a depth depth relative to, uh, relative you, to like the skull, for example. But can't right? you also can't you also adjust the absolute the depth of the of area you're looking at? Like like you can adjust just, the depth, but not the width of that 
So you don't think you can adjust the width? You can't adjust the thickness. So you can, but you'd really? be getting a worse image. You'd be getting a blurrier image. Well, that's, I might, well, you say blurrier, that's, I think, in what sense? It's blurry like you're going to get more It's blurrier shelf. because uh, you get, a, there's, every microscope looks at a plane, right? Yeah. And so the difference between uh, a two-photon microscope and a normal fluorescence microscope is that the normal fluorescence microscope gets signal, gets light from like different parts of the Z plane. Yeah. Depth plane. But they interfere. It creates a blurry image because they're yeah. not focused. Yeah. So the two photon thing, you, all, you see more or less only on that like Z plane. What you th I think what you would want, you would need to move your, um, move your objective such that it samples from different depths and then collect every end so, frame. So that's a very, I'm going to go read the paper and see what they did because that's critical in this case. You know, what are we looking at here is a really interesting question. If he, if he moves the depth up and down, the, the, the plane up and down until he finds a cell, then how much did he have to move it? And, and, and then is he perhaps sampling uh, one of, you know, I'm talking about something that might be, let's say, um, a maximum of a 20 microns deep, where you might have 10 cells in that or something like that. And, and he might have to move up and down 20 microns just to get the right cell active here until he finds a cell that's actually uh, fitting that requirement. I had the impression he was imaging this whole thing at once, that he, was, he would just set the focal plane and he imaged the whole thing. Yeah, yeah that's right. But, but I don't know how that would work because if he really had it very, very narrow, then he wouldn't actually be measuring exactly the same depth everywhere. And three microns is tiny. You know, we're talking about a thickness here. I don't know what the thickness of this tissue is, but um, uh, three microns is so thin that over this distance, you're, just, you're gonna be pretty much out of alignment with, on, on the left side and the right side. By the way, it's orders of magnitude less than like three microns, most likely. Okay, so let's say it's infinitely thin. Doesn't even matter, that's even better. So it's infinitely thin. So I have this infinitely thin plane and I'm capturing the cells that, that intersect it. Um, so he's going to be running this, you know, over a cross of, let's say, 360 microns here. You're going to be, you're going to be at different depths from the left side to the right side. And the question then is... Yeah, because, you're, because the, you know, the plane is going to be perfectly horizontal, but the, the skull the is not. Yeah, yeah the, the tissue is not. not. The tissue yeah. is not. The tissue is... Yeah, but at any angle. but any point in this X Y space, there you, I think they do a lot of controls to make sure you only get one cell. Okay, so all right, this is an area of in investigation for me. What I'm interested in is it possible that that there are actually multiple cells at each of these locations in the X Y plane of the entorhinal cortex, and, and only one of them is active, but they're finding that one, <laughs> and therefore they say, yeah, that's the cell. Okay, good. Um, uh, and this could explain perhaps why, perhaps I, that why sometimes you miss one because maybe they're just slightly out of plane or at a different point in time, it's a different cell or whatever. It's, it's a little hard for me to say. You uh, definitely miss like at least like the, I mean, there are cells that are more superficial and deeper that you will miss. That's just the thing you have to accept. So, but he, he wanted to make sure he caught all of them. He didn't, he has no blank holes here. So I'm going to have to read how we did it. Hopefully it's in the paper. I mean, oh, from okay. what I understand seeing the paper, it's, this is all like one image. That's right. So, yeah. so to me, that seems, uh, it seems unlikely that a single, very infinitely narrow plane would achieve the result he got. Right. Well, a, the, right. It doesn't well, seem likely to me. All right. Um, that's it. I'm going to read the paper again. I, well, know, this is probably a superimposing of several sites of several mice that they uh, use I don't schematic. think so this doesn't look like it this is a very precise drawing here is it, oh, yeah, but I mean I've seen a lot of papers that do this uh, they map from several so there's okay okay we recorded from enough mice and we found a cell here we'll put it here and we build this little map together now right. I haven't read well, this paper I'll look at it I'll look at it tomorrow given most of these papers that's why I uh, assume they do okay I, I was under the assumption that that's not what they're doing because the precision of the shape here which would be unique to the animal and be, sometimes this stuff is just cartoony too right you can't um, average out this shape well this is pretty pre pretty precise for cartoony <laughs> no, i understand but still you know. <laughs> you know i even asked him the question like well these are these are pyramidal cells these pink circles and i said is it you know, why is it, is it always on the border? Yes, it's always on the border. You know, why is this one on the border and this one's not on the border? I think I asked him this. So this one doesn't seem to be, you know, overlapping the blue and he goes, yeah, I don't know why that was. 
was like, so he didn't say right. like, oh, this is a hand wavy drawing. He said this like, yeah, well, it's, it's, not, it's data driven, definitely. But look, look, the all of these parameter okay. patches are perfectly circular and all right. <laughs> so like there uh, is a cartoonization. Well, those are, but he was focused on this. So and no, this is not the, this, this but is I'm not the same this has got a lot of waviness in it that that if you were averaging out, I don't know how you would end up with this. I will read the paper tomorrow. We don't need the so I yeah, just want to, sh this is all good. This is exactly what we want to get out of this day. I want to understand like, how do I interpret these roles? Maybe there's something else going on here. Is it possible that there are actually many more cells that are representing this location, this phase module, and we're only seeing one. And there are other ones that are active in different environments at different places. And um, so that was the hypothesis I was working on, that that, that picture is a bit misleading. So that's what they're saying in this thing here. Could the tank imaging method actually be detecting any active cell in the set of cells, all 10 would likely be within 20 microns in depth to copy each other. So we've, we've, we've already beaten that horse a bit here, uh, talking about this. I'm gonna look at the, the, the methods of that section of that paper, see if I can learn something. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll read this paper too. Um, so then, you know, I've been, I've been working on this idea that, should, as I said, it would be really powerful system if every mini column in some sense had a set of 1D grid cell cells, and, and only it's about 10, or even five would work just fine. And that, and as, and, and that, wouldn't that be really cool? And I, I have, I'm not going to walk through that here, but I said a column with 400 mini columns could have 400 small grid cell modules, each where grid cell modules is 1D. And so now I have enough cells to sample from. I have, I have a lot of, a whole bunch of really interesting ideas, like, you know, it could be that when the animal first goes into the environment, all those cells fire briefly, just like the temple memory until we know where we are. It's sort of the inverse of the temple memory is working from the bottom up versus the top down. Um, the big problem with this, I really love this idea, it's really wonderful. The problem with this would say that I would see active grid cells in every single mini column. And that clearly does not look like to be the case here. We don't, we see an active grid cell here, but nowhere else in this phase quadrant. We see an active grid cell here, but no one else in this phase quadrant. Um, and so the whole idea is that only one, you know, the bump of, the bump of activity is moving along. And it's not like you have, you know, a, it doesn't work, it doesn't look like this, the problem. And then I, then I have this really fundamental question. You have a you have a, 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 set, a cortical column whose whose quote the active mini columns the reference the receptor fields of mini columns are very much based on the sensory input. Think about V1. Okay, this is an orientation cell of 90 degrees. This is one at 75 degrees, whatever. And yet the grid cells themselves, if they were underneath that in a column, and so in fact, imagine this is a cortical column, and now I'm looking at the grid cells in layer six down here, something like that. These cells then are not, they're clearly not driven by sensory data directly. That is, you can't say, oh, because I have a left edge here that this cell should be active. Um, but it's not clear to me how, what would, what would, what would cause the active grid cell to move to another mini column. It, it's, this gets back to the, the uh, interference model. Uh, so it's interference model. It's just really it confusing to me. It's really hard for me to imagine how this all works. Um, why, you know, how does I have a set of cells at the bottom of the column that have some pattern of activity, which I can imagine, and then they all shift um, somehow, which I have trouble imagining. Um, um, it's just uh, hard to imagine. Oh, here's a, no, I don't know. I just don't know. I don't know if you're following my, my puzzlement there, but it's just really hard uh, to imagine how that would work. All right. Um, I don't want to cut this too short, but I do have, I did get some things out of this, and I didn't want to take too much of your time. I'm going to go read the tank paper again. Um, and see if I can learn more from its method section. Um, and unless someone wants to talk about this and ask me questions about it or suggest things, I'm, I'm not even sure if you're following it. Um, uh, I'm not trying to really start a big topic, but I just want to make sure uh, you've considered, I think you have, but uh, the thing you were just proposing with 1D modules, if that's what was actually going on in the tank picture and we're just seeing one of the cells in that module, those cells, uh, let's see. If they're 1D modules, they're not going to look like grid cells. They're not going to look like 2D grids. They're yes. going to look like 1D like planes or bands, basically. Well, well the, the, the way they would respond to the movement in space, yes, that's right. There'd be like, there'd be 1D bands in, in every different direction. Yeah. Okay. Just making sure that, yeah. Yeah. So. But by the way, that works beautifully. In terms of the, the, the things I need to have a high dimensional space, um, to be able to map motor commands onto movements of the grid cells, to have enough cells that I can always sample from and get a good representation of space. All those things work beautifully in that regard. 
It just doesn't mm -hmm. look like grid cells. <laughs> it yeah. looks like something else. So I'm, I'm, on the one hand, I can imagine the system works beautifully and it, and it riffs off the temporal memory algorithm, which works pretty well too. <laughs> and yet it doesn't look like that. In, in the actual tissue. So that, that's why I came up like, could the grid cells we're seeing be some sort of projection of what's actually happening? That somehow we all got this wrong. We're looking at grid cells, that, that it, there's something else going on and that this image that we all have in our mind of what a grid cell module looks like, is, it's not really what's going on. It's just some sort of what you would see if you looked at a slice of it, <laughs> you know, something like that. So you're, you're saying whether grid cells are an epiphenomena. Uh, yeah. Epiphenomena or more of a, um, um, an artifact of the method, uh, or or it's a it's another representation that's derived from the fundamental grid cell. So maybe there's like this fundamental grid cell with a one D in four hundred of each minicom, and then there's another representation which looks like these things, uh, which we call grid cells. So it's like a step somehow, or or it could be just it's just an artifact of the methodology for how they're looking. Like, oh yeah, we're looking at this very thin slice and so most of the grid cells we're not seeing. So there are whole other planes of grid cells that are actually active doing different things. We're not looking at them. We're only looking at this slice. Well, um, that's, what, how you, that's how you explain the human weasel results, right? Is that they're- Yeah, well that's, that worked for the human weasel results. It's a little bit problematic. If you think like if you're recording from a single grid cell in a rat running around in, a, in, a, in an environment, and they clearly show this two-dimensional tiling for that cell. That doesn't fit here. You know, I don't, I, this, my, the thing I just proposed doesn't do that. It just, I would find cells that, as Marcus said, that are sort of 1D grid cells. They just, they, they only they divide the world into planes. And that many dimensions is it's just a series of planes in one dimension. Um, that's what you'd see. So you wouldn't see the singular grid cells that you see with single unit recordings. I just think there's something wrong here. I just, just none of this adds up to me. Some, something is, something is wrong. <laughs> we don't know how this works. I don't think anyone knows how this works. <laughs> so the evidence seems to be contradicting. Well, if you want something that's out in left field, uh, are you familiar with the Retinick's theory of vision? No, I might've so, read it once, but. So one of the concepts of the idea is, is how do you get color constancy in the human visual system where no matter what the illumination is, you still seem to recognize the colors for what they are. And the idea was that across the visual field, there's some kind of integration going on that abstracts the two phenomena and that integration of, of shifting of contrast as you move across the visual field somehow comes up with an idea of color constancy. Well, in that's, it's not quite the same thing as location, but it's still a multi-dimensional concept in terms of red, green, and blue, and that combination, that stimulus remains constant no matter how you're hitting with light. So that's the only other phenomenon I know of that does integration across a large area. I, I, I don't know if you read it, but actually this is something I put in my book, which I was debating to put in at all. Uh, but it's in there, so <laughs> okay. um, where I, I gave the argument I was talking about in the consciousness chapter, I was talking about qualia and, this, and different types of qualia, and I was arguing that something like color constancy uh, could come out of something, uh, it's a model. I was arguing that it has to be part of your model of the world because color doesn't really exist in the world. It's a, it's a phenomenon that the brain creates, and color constancy is kind of odd, and I argued that you could model that kind of quality, uh, and I went to an example in depth about this, by, in, it's a sensory motor problem where you could be learning a sensory motor model of color based, where instead of location, it's orientation. So you're, you're, the, the, the color presents itself differently based on different orientations in the same way that a, a coffee cup presents itself differently on different uh, features based on different orientations. Um, and so you could build a model of color constancy uh, or quality. That was the point of that was to show that some quality, not all, but some quality can be understood as a cortical model, um, uh, sensory motor model. Anyway, yep. so I'm not. I, I don't know how that helps me, uh, uh, Kevin. I'm not sure how the Retinix model helps me in this regard. Uh, I need more detailed. You know, I'm looking for detailed mechanisms um, to do this. If, it, if it's a very detailed mechanism about how the neurons actually do this and how you create SDRs and so on, that's important. If it's like, hey, there's some integration going on, eh, I don't know what to do with it. Okay, okay. <laughs> That's so, perfect. Um, all right, anything else? 
this is good. And if there's nothing else, I will go read that paper tomorrow.